All right. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning, and it's a beautiful day to praise God together uh, as we celebrate all the ways that he's been at work this week in our community uh, and in our world, and has been at work in our hearts as well. I love hearing the encouraging conversations before service, uh, people lifting each other up, or even just getting to know each other a little bit better. Uh, it's just part of being the church, part of being God's church, part of being his, his hands and feet in our world to make to make an impact in our communities, uh, and to tell the world about him, to be a light to the world. So let's go to him in prayer this morning as we begin in worship. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for every person here, and the stories that they bring, the, the successes and the failures. God, we pray that as we come here today to church, and as we encourage one another, as we take communion together, as we sing praises together, God, that you look into our hearts. God, that you look past any fronts that we bring, any masks that we bring, and see who we really are. And God, we know that we are completely dependent upon you, that you are the source of love and joy and peace in this world. And so God, we pray that as we worship you, that we're able to throw down those, those burdens, throw down the masks that we wear, the, the falsehoods, that we believe in at your feet and pick up the grace that only you could provide. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand as we begin in worship. Worthy. 
mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered. Yeah. 
thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you for the story of the prodigal son that your son Jesus told to us so many years ago. And how when he was lost and hopeless and preparing a speech to, to try to say to come back to you that, may, that maybe his father would accept him. But God, when his father saw him in the distance, he just ran to him and embraced him and forgave him for all that he had done. But God, to hear that story and know that that is how you have treated us, that in our darkness when we were lost and hopeless and wondering what to do next, we could run to you. We find comfort, love, joy, and peace, and eternal life. And for that, we thank you and we praise you. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. Please be seated. Morning, church. Uh, this is communion time, and we partake together. So we hold the emblems until we partake as a body. Um, interesting, he's talking about hopelessly lost. My communion thought this morning is on GPS. How many out there have not used GPS? <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, nobody, nobody's hands go up. Uh, yeah, we use it to travel. We misuse it. People go across bridges they aren't supposed to and tear them down. And, and I know there's a sign in southern Indiana that there's a road that says, don't believe the GPS, turn around <laughs> so you can't get back out. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a discussion with Jeff this morning. I've always been pretty prideful about being able to just go by the seat of my pants, and there's times when it'll get you. You know, the clouds move in, or the fog moves in, and and years ago we had the opportunity to go to Germany, and when, when I went to bed that night in Berlin, I thought I knew where I was, and when the sun come up in the west the next morning, I was lost for all day. But, uh, Back to GPS. Farmers use it to plant, you know, because a lot of them got auto steer. I don't. I I know I've been struggling with mine because I just finally give in. Bought one, bought a unit, used unit this last spring, and and you think, oh gee, I can just go back to where I just got done spreading and start in again, and then no signal. So our focus this morning, though, is how God should be our GPS. He, was, he led the Israelites out of bondage. He was their fire at night and their cloud in the day to go by. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose the easy way. But the gateway to life is small and the road is narrow and only a few ever find it. In John 3, 16, of course, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. So, you know, GPS stands for global, and he sent his son into the world for you and I. And John 10, 14 through 18, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay, lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also, and they, must, they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may have it back again. No one can take my life from me. I lay down my life voluntarily. For I have the right to lay it down when I want to and also the power to take it again. For my Father has given me this command. 
So let's, uh, let's pray and then take a moment to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for each and every one of us. Let's keep our focus on him. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray, thank you so much, Lord, for this day that you've given us to come to take this, come partake of this meal and to remember you for all that you've done. You, we need to always keep you in our sights, Lord, in everything we do. And we thank you, Lord, for always being there for each and every one of us. All we have to do is accept your gift and, and follow you. We just pray for your blessing upon this meal and this cup. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that night in the upper room, he said, this is my body, broken for each and every one of you. Partake and eat. Let's do likewise. Then he followed by saying, this is my blood shed for you. Partake and drink. Let us do likewise. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, again for this time. We thank you, Lord, for all the gifts you've bestowed upon us. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with the offering given this morning and help us to use it to further your kingdom and bring you glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. couple things here very quickly. Um, first of all, some of you probably noticed a little bit of a discrepancy in one side of the building being nice and cool, which Amy's on, and the other side is kind of warm. Uh, that The reason is we are in the process of replacing the last furnace and air conditioning unit that needs to be replaced here in the church, and unfortunately, you guys are on the side where the air conditioner isn't working yet, and I'll give you a minute if you want to move, and this is besides the side where it's working at. It's kind of cool, so they, uh, they should have it done by next week with no problem, but the trustees in the church have been in the process of uh, literally replacing now all of the furnaces and the air conditioners throughout the whole building, which has been quite a process, but they were all old. I'll uh, just put it that way, and they needed replacing. So that's why there's a little bit of a problem here today, but it just kind of shows you things do get um, done around here. Kim Summerlot is now in Cameron in the swing bed program, room 216. Uh, if you want to send her a card or stop by and say hey and be in prayer for her. Also, you probably know by now that Joanne Dodge passed away. Her funeral services are tomorrow, calling from 10 to 11, and then the funeral at 11 o'clock at White's here in town. And then after the committal service, there's going to be a meal here um, at the church. Tomorrow night also is the men's fish fry. Roger's got 500 fillets that need to be eaten. So men, show up, bring a friend. Um, it'll be a great evening. And then also we've got Frank Weller from Great Lakes uh, that's going to share with us after the meal. So that'll be a good evening. And also a week from Monday is the showing of um, The Sound of Freedom. Uh, if you haven't got your ticket yet... Um, get one. If you read the post that Sin and I put on our Facebook page, I got part of that from um, looking online and seeing different celebrities talking about it. And um, one of them said very plainly, Mel Gibson, he said, this is a horrendous problem. And you hear about it, you read about it, but the first thing you need to do uh, to take care of a problem like this is be aware of the problem. And then he says, go see the movie. That will raise your awareness level to where it needs to be. It's not an enjoyable movie. It's not one you're going to laugh at, but it's one you need to see. And I cannot, Sin and I have done everything we can to make it available to you guys. 
So I hope you take advantage of it, get some tickets from us this morning. Um, I'll give them to you if I have to, because we want to fill that place up to let you know what's going on in this world, especially um, here in this country. So anyway, um, it's coming up rather rapidly. We have tickets. Uh, I'll be back in the back quickly. Cindy takes a little bit longer because she's up here playing, but we have tickets um, for you here today if you're hopefully planning on going. Okay, I think that's everything I was supposed to bring up. We're continuing our look in the book of Genesis. We're looking at those accounts that we accept as factual and true. And as we read these accounts in the book of Genesis that we accept as factual and true, we compare our lives to them because it's truth and we need to understand that. Today we're going to look at self-control, pretty much, pretty much my whole life. Probably from the time high school on, um, I've been on one diet or another. I have probably lost, at one time or another, about a dozen people, as in I've lost this many pounds and it equaled a person. Uh, I go up and down, you've seen me do this, my weight has been from really thin I used to do a lot of road races. Mike McKenzie and I rode to get, ran together. I never could beat that guy. He always was ahead of me. He'd take off, man, he'd take off like a flash, and I never could catch him. But anyway, um, to medium, I'm kind of in that between medium and big right now, and then big, and then, oh, my goodness. You know, that's the weight class I've been in, as I, and you guys have seen me go through this. You know, I've been in this area a long time. I take up more closet space than most people because I've got small Medium, big. I get rid of all oh my gosh clothes because I say I'm never going to go there again, but I, 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 I have a couple times. Now, you're going to have a hard time believing this, but it's true. When I was young, my nickname was Bird. Had nothing to do with me teaching Larry Bird how to play basketball or anything like that. But I was so small and skinny when I was in lower elementary. My mom would buy the slim gym jeans and take the legs up. Hence, I got the nickname from my family, Bird Legs, that got shortened to Bird later on. I don't have many first cousins left, but um, some of them used to call me that when we would ever get together because that was the nickname that I went by. Now, there are some thin people who have no sympathy for overweight people. There's people who've been thin their entire lives, and it doesn't make any difference how many kids they've had. It doesn't make any difference how much food they eat. It's their metabolism. Uh, I was kidding Terry this morning, his sister Diane. Uh, they attended the South Milford Church when I was preaching there. She had two boys while I was preaching there. And both times when she came back to church for the first time after giving birth, she had the same genes on that she had before she got pregnant. The women were very envious. That, that, that's one word that I'll put there. Uh, now, I realize, though, through all of this, all the various diets, all the exercise, um, it all boils down to one word, self-control. You have to watch what you eat, and you can't eat as much. But my problem is I like food. I even like liver and onions. There, there's not too many foods that I don't like um, at the picnic at the house. Uh, we had a bunch of people there. Uh, right off the bat, I went to the dessert table because there was a custard pie there. Jackie Weber made a custard pie. So I got a piece of custard pie, and I ate it while everybody else was going through the line. Then I got my food, and I was going to get another piece of custard pie, but there wasn't any left. I wasn't real happy about that. So I didn't need that second piece because I already had my dessert first, but I just really like custard pie. Now, when I was in high school and in college, sports, playing college basketball, and then when I went through my running kick, Mike remembers that, um, I could eat a Shetland pony and not gain a pound, you know, because I ran all the time. I'd run three to six miles every day. And when I was training for a marathon, I'd run six to 12 miles every day. And then me and a friend, it wasn't Mike, it was another guy, we would run 20 miles every Sunday afternoon. I was running 80 to 100 miles a week. You know how much food you can eat? When you're running 80 to 100 miles a week and not gain a pound, Alan knows he runs all the time. Problem was, though, I pulled a muscle one time thinking I was still young playing in a summer basketball league, and I couldn't hardly walk, let alone run, and I forgot that I should quit eating. I, I forgot that. I thought I could still eat, but I forgot I wasn't running, and oh my goodness, since then, it's just, it's just history. 
Now, a lot of people, when they hear that word self-control, they don't get really excited about it. Whether it's eating or drinking or spending, television watching, gambling, toying with the dark side roads of the Internet at night. But I believe every sin known to mankind can be traced back to this lack of self-control. Because when we don't control ourselves and all these urges, then we find ourselves caught up in sin. Now, we live in an age where everybody wants a quick fix, a miracle remedy, some kind of a spiritual workout regime, if you will. Uh, You go to worship, read your Bible now and then, pray with the kids, and everything's just going to be fine. Now, all those things help, but they can't solve the struggle that sometimes we find ourselves in in the area of self-control. So as we continue looking at Genesis and the truths that we find there, we're going to take a look at one of the Uh, in my thoughts, one of the most painful passages we see in Scripture. And I believe this will reinforce what we studied last Sunday when we looked at why we have a dark side. And this week, as we look at Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, hopefully we can learn a little bit about self-control and not get caught up with a lack of self-control as Cain did. Ralph Elliott observed this about Cain. When one's relationship with God, his father, is marred, then a tear in his relationship with his brother is not far behind. Life is composed of both vertical and horizontal relationships, and sin has a way of distorting both of them. Like I said, last Sunday we looked at the root of sin. This Sunday we're going to look at the fruit of sin as we look at Cain. First of all, let's look at Cain's struggle with self-control. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 here. Give me a second. I've got to pull this out. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain also Cain brought some of the fruits of the soils and offered to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. So the first part of the struggle with self-control that we see with Cain is he developed a selfish attitude. We read where Abel looked over his flocks. He picked out the best there was, the firstborn, and that's what he brought as a sacrifice, an offering to God. But Cain, we see this selfish attitude already arising. His heart wasn't in it. His attitude was rather sour, stingy when it came to his sacrifice. Now, we don't know exactly what God required. We're not told that. But one thing is for sure. Cain's sacrifice wasn't all that pleasing. He disobeyed what God had requested. His attitude was, I believe, God ought to be pleased. At least I'm giving him something. At least I'm thinking of him a little bit. I'm trying. But did you notice this one statement here in verse 3? In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits. You can almost read like when he got around to it. Um, God, I'll do it when I've got the time. You see, we need to ask ourselves, when we're giving to God, whether it's our time, our talents, our treasure, whatever it is, are we ever guilty of just kind of having that kind of an attitude? Oh, yeah, I'm walking by the offering boxes back there in the back, but eh, it's been a tough week. I've got some expenses coming up, things like that. I, I, I'll give a little bit more. Or I'll give something when I get around to it. Or I am... Um, Can't do anything else this weekend. The weather's nasty and stuff like that, so I might as well go to church. And yeah, I know they need a lot of help doing something there at the church, but you know what? One of these days, I'll have a little bit more time, and then I'll I'll pitch in and do my part. That kind of thinking, when that enters into our minds, we just have this mediocre sacrifice attitude towards God. Ann Graham Lott said, Cain brought whatever he could spare when he felt like it. He was very casual in what he gave to God. He gave his leftover fruit, his leftover time, his leftover attention, and his leftover effort, never ever caring that God hates leftovers. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. 
Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That's a great, vivid word picture that God here has given to Cain. This picture of an animal about ready to pounce on its prayer. He's saying that's the way Satan is, right outside your door, right outside your life, just waiting to pounce when he has the opportunity. If you've ever seen a cat, uh, when you're playing with it with a toy, or maybe it's outside and there's a mouse there somewhere, sometimes I'm driving and I'll see one along the ditch, and it's just motionless, except its tail's twitching a little bit. And I'll slow down because I know what's going to happen. Pretty soon that cat just pounces because there's a mouse there or something like that. God's saying, Cain, you better be careful with this attitude you've got because Satan is just waiting for that door just to open a crack, and he's going to pounce. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. This selfish attitude progressed then deeper in sin, and it yields to this impulsive desire. Verse 8 in chapter 4 there. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now, no doubt, up until this point, when he killed his brother, every time he saw Abel, he probably had jealousy, maybe guilt because of the mediocre sacrifice he gave. He despised his brother. And so much it says here that it led to him killing him. King Solomon says a fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. God warned Cain. He said, you, you better check your anger. You better check this problem you've got because Satan's crouching at your door. You better become the master of your emotions. Gain some self-control. Anger can really be dangerous. Uh, the Bible says about anger in one place, in your anger, sin not. Now, there are some times when it's appropriate to be angry. Jesus showed anger when he cleared the temple uh, of the money changers. But the question is, what is angering you? To what degree do you allow your anger to grow? That's the first area we need to be careful in Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, you, you've always heard the advice, married couples, never go to bed angry. Cindy and I have never went to bed angry. We went three days in a row one time without going to bed, but we've never went to bed angry. I just made that up. That's not true. She's giving me the look. You know, I, I, I know what the look is. Um, but recognize anger doesn't always manifest itself in physical aggression. Cain and his anger toward his brother caused him to maybe take a blunt instrument and, and, and kill him. Now, stop and think about that. He had seen animals die in sacrifices to God. But this is the first time we read in the Bible where a human being ever died, was killed. And I wonder what he had to have been thinking after he took the life of his brother, seeing him lying there, maybe the blood pooling around his head on the ground. You'd think, you'd say, oh, God, what have I done? What have I done? What am I going to tell mom and dad? I'm sorry, I can't believe this. But that's not what the Bible says Cain felt. He responded with a rebellious spirit. Genesis 4, 9 through 12. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Look what happened because of sin. Last week, when we looked at Adam and Eve, and God came into the garden looking for them, saying, where are you at? What did they do? They hid themselves. They were terrified at the presence of God. They were scared. They were frightened. One generation, one generation later, and we see Cain just being totally cynical 
towards God. When God came to him, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't trying to hide. He wasn't scared. No respect, no fear. He flippantly says, hey, am I my brother's keeper? What do I care? You see how sin hardened his heart. And it's still doing that to people today. And this happened in one generation. See how quickly things can change. Given to rage, a person can actually act out and commit murder without seemingly knowing what he's doing. Years ago, many years ago, in the community of South Milford, there was an individual that lived there. He didn't come to the church. I knew who he was. And he and his wife had divorced. They had a son, very rebellious, and, and he was with mom. And it got to the point where mom says, I, I can't handle him. I can't handle him. So sent him to live with dad to try to get these emotions under control. Put him in the school system and just as bad as it always was. One evening, kicked out of school, called the, called the principal, found out what he'd done, confronted his son. They got into a verb, verbal confrontation. One thing led to another and they got into a fight. And he strangled his son and killed him. I remember going to see him in jail. And I remember him saying, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. I, I, I just can't believe it. How could I do something like that? Well, given to rage. You can't keep it under control. A person will act out and commit murder without seemingly knowing about it. God came to Cain. And Cain was so hardened by rage when Cain, the murderer, faced the almighty judge of the universe he simply said, am I my brother's keeper? Notice while we're here that every sin always leads up to some kind of a cover-up. There seems to be a cover-up of a previous sin, and the worse the sin is, the more the cover-up is to try to make you a little bit better. Cain tried to play the victim mentality like we see today. You know, his parents had been foolish. They threw away paradise. He was lonely, didn't have anybody his own age. God rejected him. Even though he knew God personally, he felt like God was showing favoritism to his little brother. No doubt he said, I'm a victim through all of this. And if we're not careful, when we feel like we've been wrong, we can start down that road of victim mentality as well. We speak up for our rights, we think. We try to take matters into our own hands and retaliate. Maybe it's kind of like the guy in the Navy overseas. He was engaged to this beautiful young girl back home and had her picture and had it she had it specially taken for him given to him when he was deployed and but he got a letter a dear john letter she said um i've met somebody else i'm breaking up with you i'm going to get married by the way that picture you have of me that was specially taken that's one of my favorite pictures of myself would you please send it back you talk about kicking a guy when he's down well, the guy thought about it, and he thought, okay. So he went around to all the other guys in his unit. He said, you got any pictures of your sisters or somebody like that that you don't care if I could have? And so pretty soon he collected this pile of pictures. He put them in a box, and he sent it back to his girlfriend. He says, um, please find your picture in this pile and send the rest of them back to me because for the life of me, I can't remember which one you are. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And if we're not careful, just like Cain, because we can be selective about what sins we confess to God and ask for forgiveness for and what ones we tend to play dumb on. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, back to Genesis chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him could kill him. Now, did you ever wonder, why did God do that? Now, we don't know what the mark was, but there was something that would keep anybody from killing Cain out of retaliation or revenge because he killed his brother. 
Now, later on, we know that God, when he gave the law, the Ten Commandments to Moses, he set up procedures for bringing justice to murderers. He set up sanctuary areas for those who were falsely accused of murder. It seems like God's focus here was preventing this never-ending cycle of revenge to which we're prone. For now, God simply said, I'm the one that will take care of it. And you know what? In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 tells us the same thing. Don't seek revenge. God takes care of these things. And it kind of started with this picture he gives us that back then. But we have to notice there's some incredible consequences because of the choices Cain made. God expects us to be responsible for our own actions. And that's what we're going to talk about next week as we conclude this series. But Cain would be punished for his sin regardless of all the excuses he made. He had a tremendous struggle with self-control, just like a lot of people do today. What are some steps we can take to overcome this problem with self-control? First of all, admit you're vulnerable. Recognize that you are capable, I'm capable, of the most repulsive sin if we're not on guard against it. I realize that I'm, doing, I'm capable of doing something just as immoral Cain if I don't practice self-control. If one would allow anger or lust or greed or pride to get the best of them, if that's the choice that's made within a heartbeat, it may ruin your testimony for the rest of your life. Remember I talked about that friend of mine that I went to school with, and we all got in trouble in the sixth grade. We had to put our names on the blackboard. We all got a paddling. He didn't put his name up there. When he died a few years ago, this is terrible. The, mer- the first thing I thought was, oh yeah, the liar. One little thing like that. You've got to be on guard all the time. We hear the story of Cain and Abel, and we think, I could never physically hurt someone like that. To take a life in cold blood? Never. But yet people have no problem verbally assaulting someone, making obscene gestures to another driver, cutting down a co-worker in front of others, ridiculing your spouse with insult after insult. Now, now you might be thinking, preacher, this sermon has nothing to do with me. I've got myself under control. I don't struggle with any of these things you're talking about this morning. I would say be very careful. Because if you're not watching over these areas, if you feel there's no way that Satan can get in there, that's exactly where he's going to start attacking. The old saying, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Given the opportunity, I've known people who have embezzled from their company, addicted to pornography, caught up in things you thought you needed and you became miserly instead of generous, caught up in gambling. You know what's interesting to me? You see the commercials for the lottery, and you see the commercials for any alcoholic beverage. What disclaimer do they always have on there? The lottery at the very end of it says, play responsibly. If you have a problem, call this number. All the alcohol commercials say, drink responsibly. If you have a problem, call this number. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? They realize, without a shadow of a doubt, they realize that what they are selling What they are trying to promote can cause addictive behavior that can totally ruin someone's life and family. They know this. They know what they're selling can do horrible things to people. So to get rid of the responsibility, they throw a little caveat there. Drink responsibly. Gamble responsibly. If you've got a problem, call this number. Am I my brother's keeper? We're all vulnerable in different ways. For you, it may not be what you say, it may be how you live. Maybe for our thoughts and our mind, how we act. C.S. Lewis said the surest road to hell is a gradual one. The slope is so gentle. So we have to admit that we're vulnerable, and then we have to realize the consequences of losing control. Have you ever seen somebody just lose it? Lash out at somebody almost out of character, saying things in anger they'd normally say, things they wouldn't do? Realize as Christians... When we allow that to happen, our opportunity to witness to those individuals or others pretty much is shot. We have to discipline ourselves to practice self-control by realizing the consequences. 
have you ever been around someone who started to lose their control? Maybe they're standing next to their wife or something like that, and they raise their hand up, and their wife kind of cowers a little bit. Or maybe the kids are around, and mom and dad gets really mad at one of them. They, they raise their hand just maybe to make a gesture, but the kid kind of cowers. When I see that, I think, man, what's happening behind closed doors? What's, what's going on there? This person doesn't have control. Sometimes I act and listen to people in public, and I think, my gosh, if they talk like that in public, if they use swear words in public, and sometimes around the preacher, oh, excuse me, I think, if they do that in front of people in public, what do they do behind closed doors? No, no self-control. I have no tolerance for people that cuss. I have no tolerance for people that lose their temper and stuff like that. Why? Because to me, that's just total lack of self-control. You know, so I, I had a guy years ago, he was an elder in the church, my very first church, my goodness. The Lord had to really be on my back to keep me in the ministry because, like I said, I think I told you before, I came home from a board meeting one night and my wife was sitting in the living room and I opened the door and my Bible bounced off the wall on the other side of the room. She said, bad meeting? <laughs> what was your first thought? Um, but I had an elder one time said, ah, if you're not, I, I'm a man. I could, I could get that guy so mad he'd cuss at me and want to fight me. And I thought, that's not being a man. That's somebody that has no control, that has no self-control. Have you been in somebody's home where you can tell that spending has just been out of control? And you can tell they're so far in debt, if they even talk about finances, it's kind of setting the fuse off. I guarantee you, everyone here, everyone that may be watching this later, including myself, has made some major mistakes. Major mistakes. I know I sure have. And I imagine if you're honest, all of you have too. But what we need to realize this morning is we should not be like Cain. But rather when we get, make those mistakes, we get back on course. We heed God's warnings. Third step, depend on God. Uh, you know, at the intro, I talked about my weight. And I know what it takes to get it under control. Like I said, I've tried every diet that is known to mankind and I, need, I realize the problem is not with the type of food I eat or anything like that. The problem is me being under self-control and knowing when to stop, not going back for that second piece. I've been known to hide a piece of custard pie so I could have my second piece of custard pie, you know? The whole principle is we have to recognize that we rely on God's power, not our own power. Uh, our fulfillment has to come not on external things. It has to come from the fact that God deemed us so valuable to him that he died on our behalf. Our fulfillment has to come above everything else on a personal relationship with God. I, I, I don't know what your struggles are this morning. I know what mine are, and I have a lot of areas that Satan's just waiting for that crack to open up so he can pounce. I know that. Like I said, any sin can be traced to selfishness and lack of self-control. You all know what a oxymoron is. It's a phase with conflicting terms like jumbo shrimp, rubber cement, peaceful confrontation. Roy Lawson says self-control is a bit of an oxymoron. It sounds like we're capable of controlling ourselves, but that's not what the Bible teaches. According to Scripture, self-control is considered a self that is controlled not by self, rather by God. The Apostle Paul struggled with this. Listen to what he said in Romans 7. 18 and 18 through 20. Um, for I know that the good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And then in verse 24, he said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And, and then verse 11, there's first few words there. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, my Lord, our Lord. So as we wrap this up, the question is, what sin is crouching at the door of your heart, of my heart? Is it resentment, adultery, jealousy, greed, bitterness, lust, selfishness, anger, 
I could go on and on and on. We've got to acknowledge that a lot of times we lose our self-control, and usually that happens when we think we have to be the ones in control of our lives rather than God. We've got to allow Him to be the one. If we're not careful, we can lose our witness by living a life that's controlled by self, not by God. How is it that a person with a volatile temper, how is it with a person with an alcohol addiction, how is it that a person who's a habitual liar, how is it that all of a sudden that person changes and all of a sudden they become just the opposite? These terrible things are out of their lives. How is that happening? It's simple. It's God. And every person that's went through a change like this will say, it's God. God touched my life. Paul says again in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, You who, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, does God's Spirit live inside of us? Well, we know we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, but are we allowing it to truly lead us and guide us? Do we really believe that Jesus is God's Son? Do we really recognize that we're not perfect, that we have weak areas, we have struggles? And are we willing then to truly, if we're immersed believers, truly turn our life over to the Lord? And if you're not an immersed believer, are you ready to make that decision? Are you ready to turn your life over and be baptized into Jesus? Not into a church, but into Jesus. You see, the difference between Abel being murdered and Christ being murdered was simple. Jesus was a perfect sacrifice. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was cleansed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was put upon him by his wounds were healed. His was for a purpose because of God's great love for each one of us. So are we willing to truly yield to Christ and allow him to control our lives and our desires? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to be here with brothers and sisters in Christ as we gather in the, as a family of yours here at Pleasant View. And Father, all of us, goodness, we all have struggles. We all have those cracks in the armor, so to speak. And if we allow them to get too big, Satan's ready to pounce. Father, help us to truly yield to you. That when those temptations come up, to rely upon your spirit and your strength and not ours. Father, I pray if there's one who needs to make a decision this morning, that they'll make that decision for you as their Lord and Savior or a rededication or just right there in the pew saying, Lord, help me. You know my struggle. Help me. And maybe there's one going to be watching later on that they need to give somebody a call and say, I need to talk to you. Uh, I need to get my life lined back up with God. But in all this, Father, we give you the praise because we know the strength we need is available to us if we just turn our lives over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be standing, shall we?
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. great to see everybody here this morning and uh I, I was thinking as we were singing i don't know why things come back to your mind a funny time that summer that i was playing in the league basketball at lagrange in the parks department i was on the same team as martin and uh, i was a whole lot thinner then and i was playing guard and i think that summer martin called me dad more time than in my entire life and the reason being i was bringing the ball up and he was yelling dad because he wanted the ball to shoot it you know <laughs> I could hear him more, dad, 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 you know, that's why I'd throw him the ball, but it was a good time, it was a good time. Hey, don't forget uh, tickets, and men, don't forget tomorrow night, it's going to be a great evening with the fish fry and with Frank Weller here talking to us, so take time to come out. Have a great day.